Then, then once again, welcome to this open lecture with Sebastian Mushta. Sebastian, very pleased to have you here on the topic of moving from administration to management. Uh, lessons from the Lageso crisis. Uh, Lageso, maybe not everybody, well, you, you are probably informed, but not everybody in the street is informed, but Lageso being the famous, and I hope you excuse me for some probably infamous Berlin um, refugee authority. Um, for those of you who haven't been here to um, ESMP, just a brief information about this building and us as a school, we're an international business school being founded in 2002 and very happy to be in this former Staatsratsgebäude, the seat of the former head of state of East Germany, as you know. Um, what others do not know that much is um, this building after being having served as the um, state council building, it also served as the Bundeskanzleramt, so the chancellor's office um, for under, um, under Gerhard Schröder and a little uh, story of uh, the history of this building. When he moved in, then he was asked, do you want to have the old office of Erich Honecker and said, no, I don't. Um, so do you have another office? Of course we have another office here. So he got a different office. So we have two kind of historic offices down in the first um, floor. Um, apart from that, you might have recognized this is kind of out of date. Um, if you consider that uh, the German Democratic Republic doesn't exist anymore, but obviously it used to be the emblem of East Germany. And um, this used to be a lecture hall actually, not quite of a university, if you just take down this wall here, well, take down, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to say it this way, um, you know, just take down, so what is today, two lecture halls actually for, you know, the um, teaching our students, used to be one large uh, hall where the speaker would stand there below the uh, emblem and then to talk to uh, the guests who were invited here to the, um, to, to whatever kind of uh, lecture. Yeah, so um, since, 2009, actually, we are doing the series of um, open lectures, which focus on questions of current intellectual concern. We have, we're, we're happy to be able to read often um, very renowned speakers. And today, uh, the next on the list is Sebastian Muschta. And uh, we will discuss with him the arc between La Gieso, the Berlin Refugee Authority, and the difficulties in Germany's entire political machinery, if I may say so. I'm looking forward to hearing more about his conclusions about the desirable interaction we just talked about a little bit before and between politicians and administrators, public administration, and of course, best practices from the um, private business world. Sebastian Muschka serves currently at the, Bertelsmann at the Bertelsmann Foundation as a senior vice president. I hope I got that right, senior vice president. Before, in early 2016, he became interim president, actually, of the Berlin State um, Agency for Health and Social Services, which is the official name, the Lageso, when the sudden increase in refugees um, numbers in Berlin, especially in Berlin, had caused a, a crisis um, for the Berlin government. Sebastian Muschka joined Lageso after 11 years at McKinsey and Company, um, where his last roles were managing partner at the or of the Berlin office and co-leader of the public sector practice. So actually, the public sector seems to be kind of you know part of your whole professional life. Um, Sebastian holds a doctorate in information management from um, the University of St. Gallen. By the way, a heavy competitor for us, um, and a diploma in business from the University of Siegen. Today's lec um, lecture will be moderated by Raji Jayaraman, Associate Professor of Economics here at UCMT Berlin. But before I pass on to Sebastian Muschra, I would like to thank our long-standing media partners, um, also tonight, the Tagesspiegel and the Harvard Business Manager. So, Sebastian, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to your remarks. Thank you. Let's see if, yeah, microphone works already, perfect. Yeah, welcome and thank you for the invitation. I'm very honored. This is my second time, actually, that I'm uh, giving a presentation in this hall. Last time was three years ago as Berlin office manager for McKinsey, um, when a case study on McKinsey was taught here, and they always like to invite somebody talking about the subject. Um, no, St. Gallen is not a competition. Um, if you play with the second part of your name, you have no problems to expect. Um, St. Gallen is probably half as lively as Reinickendorf at night. Um, and that is during the day of St. Gallen. Um, 
I spent four years there and it's a very nice place of the world and I also learned a lot. Um, yeah, IT, essentially, what I learned there. And um, allow me to say a little bit how I ended up at the Lageso role, because uh, it's a little bit um, of, a, of an exception. And without overplaying my role, um, I think we need more exceptions like that, because um, I think this was one of the many opportunities that a crisis like um, the refugee influx of 2015-16 got us, and that is that um, people from the outside with um, experiences outside of law degrees and lifetime careers in the public administration, that people like that um, have a chance to, to manage um, in the public sector. And so um, what I did was essentially, um, I got a PhD in information management. Um, I worked in SAP environments, big SAP systems. Um, I joined McKinsey, um, set up a mega project management practice there. Um, I worked with a labor agency in, in um, Nuremberg for 10 years. Um, and so that was essentially my public sector background. I learned a big transformation, um, both on the IT side and also on the organizational side, how that can work. I don't know how familiar you are with the German labor agency, but it's a pretty good case of a, a successful government reform. And um, then in September 2015, when the lines of um, outside of the Lageso here in Turmstraße um, close to the Hauptbahnhof, when the lines were getting longer and longer, um, we offered our help, as McKinsey back then, um, to the Berlin state government, the Senat, um, and they were just in the process of forming a crisis um, task force, um, and we were able to help them, so I was working with this task force for a couple of months. We did some short-term relief work, um, helped with line management, registration management, and then the Lageso president was pushed aside because the um, organization was in real dire straits. Um, it was really almost falling apart. And um, in early January, the minister called me up and said he had gotten a tip that I might be open for this challenge, and he was right. So he called me up and said, do you want to take over as interim manager, interim president? Um, I talked this through with my wife, she was not happy, um, and um, really not happy. Um, she asked me why, um, and I said, I think this is one of those rare constellations where I actually can make a real impact, and it's also a huge challenge, and I thrive on challenges. So we had this very long conversation. I don't think I really convinced her. It took about eight weeks, ten weeks, um, and then we m noticed both that, um, yes, there can be a turnaround here, so this is not a Himmelfahrtskommando, not a no-return mission. And so she, she came around. Um, but, um, yeah, so this was uh, probably the most intensive um, and probably also the most fun and the most rewarding year of my life. I did this for one year, so the entire year 2016. I had a one-year um, limited contract, we needed to make sure that not a single minute was lost to um, tender um, processes and official kind of hiring processes in the public sector, which can take weeks and months, so that I could start right away. And um, it was always clear I would, would only be there for a year, and then um, I was out December 2016. I wrote a book. Two copies are actually circling, so take a peek. Um, and I'm now working for the um, Bertelsmann Foundation, and um, my topic there is scaling good ideas. So helping the public sector to benefit even those folks who can't afford consulting companies like Accenture or McKinsey, um, help those folks also with good concepts and news they can use um, to make sure that um, yeah, the public sector is enabled on a larger scale. But today I want to talk about the Lageso crisis and um, talk a little bit about uh, what I learned and what I think um, we can learn for Germany overall. Um, we are not in crisis, uh, as you all know. Um, if you look at all types of numbers, we're doing actually fairly well, which is a problem, um, because structural reforms don't happen in good times, at least not in Germany. And so um, we need to actually make sure that we learn from the crisis. There is another one looming on the horizon, and I come to that in a couple of minutes. Um, there's a huge opportunity and a huge crisis brewing, and um, I'm a little concerned, that's also the reason why I'm grabbing every speaking opportunity I can get, I'm a little concerned that we are about to miss this huge window, this huge emerging crisis, um, to build a better 
um, machinery of uh, government underneath. Um, the crisis is essentially the looming retirement wave, yeah? which gives us an opportunity to think through organizational structures with fresh eyes and um, try out some fresh ideas. Okay, so but let's start with Lageso. I move you back to August 2015. Um, I don't know if you remember um, that time. It was a couple of weeks before um, the border to, to Hungary was opened, um, before the refugee numbers coming into Germany were spiking. Um, in Berlin, we already had, in the heat of the summer, some very bad images on TV, uh, refugees lining up around the block um, in a building or in front of a building at Turmstraße, the Lageso, which is the state agency for health and social services, 1,300 employees back then. Um, we had, um, have the, the Lageso has a huge, very wide portfolio of um, topics they are in charge of. For example, they do quality control for all Berlin hospitals, for all Berlin pharmacies. They um, are the regulator for um, pharmaceutical companies, for medical companies. For um, they supervise all animal testing, they supervise genetic um, testing, genetic um, manufacturing. Um, they also take care of 600,000 Berliners that have a handicap, so they are allocating the official percentage of handicap um, that is then used for parking permits and that type of stuff. Um, all crime vit victims are essentially managed by Lageso. Um, war veterans, and so on. So the portfolio is huge. Can you hear me already? No, not yet. Okay. All right, perfect. Um, so we change tires while we are driving. That's perfect. I love that process. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we essentially, um, the number of employees dealing with refugees grew from 65 to 180 between 2011 and 2015. The number of refugees went up from 2000 in 2011 to 79,000 we registered in um, 2015. So we have 40 times more refugees and three times more employees. That's a gap that, of course, you cannot um, overcome with better processes. And um, the reason why it was so hard to actually increase the number of, of employees, Berlin at the same time was shrinking. Um, the Berlin government was shrinking. Um, after the wall came down, we had about 200,000 employees in the Berlin state government administration. And that number, I don't know if you remember, there were some famous lines of Berlin politicians, Spahn vs. Vis Quietscht, so we save until we can't save anymore. So there was a very firm hiring freeze, and um, there was the goal, the political goal, to shrink the government by 50%. So we wanted to come down to 100,000. And um, this happened in a not very strategic way. It happened essentially by not replacing people that retired. Um, so there was never this strategic question like which tasks, which government duties we are strategically growing because we are a growing city. Um, the economy is shifting. Health as an economy is um, becoming more and more important. Um, should we react? Other tasks, other duties were shrinking because, for example, war veterans were dying out. Um, so can we actually use these tasks to reallocate people so that we actually um, hire where we need people and 
don't we place in areas where we are shrinking anyway? Um, can we become more efficient? Can we um, invest in technology like electronic files instead of paper files so that um, the shrinking process would be actually accomplished or accompanied by um, a strategic concept of how we want to build the government? Of course, this didn't happen. So by the time um, 2015, the, the refugee numbers came around, the Lageso itself was pretty much kept stable slash shrinking. We had some departments that had 30-40% missing people over time, even though the number of customers had grown up. And it was in this very painful context that it was almost um, heroic that they were able to triple the number of people dealing with the refugees. Um, but it was not enough. And so by the time um, the refugee numbers became so high that nobody could um, ignore the problem anymore, um, by the time the Lageso was fi finally allowed to hire as many people as uh, it needed, um, it was too late because it takes two to three years until you have people on board that actually know what they are doing. So there's a very formal process of hiring and then you have kind of a very complex legal base that these people work on. If you print out all the laws dealing with refugees, it's probably a 40 to 50 centimeter high pile of paper. So it took us something like two years to get people to be fully, fully enabled. And um, yeah, so 79,000 people registered in Berlin. Um, to give you a perspective, um, Germany was the number one country destination for refugees in 2015. The number two country was Sweden. Germany took in 1.1 million. Um, that was the first number. And then two and a half years later, the number was corrected. No, so one and a half years later, the number was corrected down to 890,000. So we were missing something like 210,000 refugees in the process. Um, those people had moved either to Sweden and onwards, or returned to their home countries, or um, were essentially doubled registered. Um, we had the same phenomenon in Berlin. We had 79,000 people we registered, and um, only 55,000 of them showed up again to actually get shelter from us and, and um, money for food. Um, so we, miss, we were missing 24,000 people. And the reason for that was when this big surge happened in August, September, and onwards, we couldn't check if somebody was already registered. We were looking at them and we were telling them, okay, you can stay in Berlin, or we were uh, sending them to other states. There's an IT system in the background that is shifting refugees around, depending on which state has taken how many. And this um, system was essentially sending people away from their family or from relatives that they already had in Berlin and were sending them to Brandenburg or even further away. And so these people decided, instead of going to Brandenburg, I'll line up again and try to get registered again. So we were registering and registering, even though we didn't have capacity to register. But before we register refugees, they don't have anything. Um, they don't have a shelter, so they can't go anywhere. So they essentially were lining up outside of the building and the lines were getting longer and longer and longer. And uh, the Lageso scrambled to register, um, but couldn't in time. There were just not enough people there to, to do that. Um, and so it escalated. It became a humanitarian emergency. People were homeless. It was the summer heat. People were um, sick from a long refugee. Um, pregnant people in their small kids in there. Um, people in wheelchairs standing or camping outside. Um, we were closing the, the campus, the courtyard, every night, so we pushed people out into the parks. Um, and volunteers came up and said, what are you doing with these people? Um, they don't have any medical supply, they don't have food. Um, and it took the Lageso a very, very long time to, to grow up, to, uh, to uh, rise up to that challenge and um, start to realize we have to take care of these people, even though we don't know them yet. They're not registered. So, I always like to use the um, two examples from the private sector to, to get a, give you a little bit of a feel for this challenge, also on an organizational level. Imagine the best private company in the world, like the most flexible. Let's take somebody like Amazon. If we actually had, within four years, um, took Amazon from a $2 billion or euro company to an 80 billion company, Amazon would not be able to build enough warehouses and ship on time and hire enough people, etc. So times 40 in four years is operationally almost impossible to manage. So I was not surprised that the Lageso couldn't handle the search in numbers. 
The second um, that I'm, example that I'm always using, imagine you're a bank and you have something like 20 or 30 customers a day. Is anybody working in a bank? I think 30 customers a day is already a high number in 2018. So um, I think that number is continuously shrinking. Um, so anyway, imagine you have 30, num 30 people lining up in front of your, uh, your counter. And then that number goes up to 300, and then to 3,000, and then maybe to 30,000. And you realize that the line outside of your bank is actually going around the building three times. How long does it take the bank manager to actually call up the Red Cross and say, I need medical emergency supply for the people waiting in line outside of my office building? So typically, people are not in charge of this. Yeah? The customer relationship starts the moment they come into the building. And um, you actually say, all right, I'm here. I want to be registered. People also in the Lageso, took a long time to realize that the problem was theirs. Yeah? Even though they were legally not required to do anything, this was nowhere in their job descriptions, but they, it was their problem. And for me, this is a very important um, learning, the first learning, that um, government is organized by legal responsibilities, Zuständigkeiten. Yeah? And the problem, unfortunately, is sometimes very stubborn and decides to be larger or outside of regular responsibilities. And somebody has to take care of the problem and not say, well, my responsibility ends here or is partially elsewhere. And this is a very big learning that we need to think government back from the problem and not so much from the areas of responsibility. I think most of the dissatisfaction that citizens have with government come from this difference between problem and area of responsibility. Yeah? Um, a lot of these are very much baked in stone. For example, we have 150 government services and government benefits for families, and they are not all handed out by the same government agency. Yeah? You have some state level, some local level, some federal level, some social insur insurances, and they are not really well um, meshed. And we would need to think, rethink how we organize 150 government benefits. Yeah? I'm not even asking the question if we need 150, but I, at least I want to say, there's an example in the book, it's a little bit funny, sorry, forgive me for making a joke here, but let's say, let's, let's assume we need 150 flavors of bubble gum, yeah? but what we certainly do not need is 150 different machines handing out each one different flavor of bubble gum. Yeah? So at least make sure that it's one machine handing out. Yeah? And this is also something that um, in the Lageso world took a long time. Um, the Lageso one year later was very different to the one that um, I came to in September because we did have, for example, a campus management yeah, that was in charge of the well-being of the refugees outside of our buildings. Yeah? Um, and so we saw that a lot of these responsibilities enlarged and we were able to think fresh. Yeah? I think um, these numbers on the outside of the building, they, they came into the inside of the building and were hitting a machinery um, processes that were just not up to the task, not only in registration, but also in benefit management. We um, were essentially um, around October, November, December, not able anymore to hand out benefits, even to ref uh, refugees that were sitting in shelters and had to buy their own food. So we were only giving them a bed, but we were not feeding them anymore. But we were not paying them money because we didn't have the people in place to, to pay them. And so we had a, um, a crisis, and this was pretty much on the day that I arrived, we had a crisis where some refugees were starving in their shelters. Yeah? They were borrowing money from other refugees, but um, they were essentially starving. And what had happened is that um, the department inside the Lageso um, had essentially collapsed. Yeah? The, the pressure, the number of customers, the number of refugees per day was so high, um, and management back then um, was essentially saying, all right, there are 100 people, you deal with 100 customers. There are 200, you deal with 200, 300, and so on. So for an individual employee, in regular times, she or he was um, handling five to six cases a day. Each case takes about 45 minutes to, to an hour. Um, and the number from went from five to six to first to eight, then to 10, then to 15, then to 20, and then to 25. And um, around 20, 25, people were just collapsing. And whenever somebody was taking sick leave, the other colleagues had to actually pick up the workload. So 
they were actually stuck in a system where the harder they worked, the more work they were getting. And um, that led to a chain reaction that essentially only the most viable, strongest people were still coming to work. And everybody who just, I mean, for me, this was the, the quintessential Sisyphus work. Yeah? Um, no matter how many cases, how many refugees you actually handle per day, there were still coming more and more and more. It didn't end. And so when I took over, we had 60% sick leave in that critical department. And so it was no wonder that um, the refugees were starving. Yeah? Um, so that was the crisis. What did we do? Um, some very simple things. I essentially told the Workers' Council, um, let's start from the ground up. Let's define what can we actually do per day realistically. So what's the number of cases the people that are there can handle without overtaxing them? The, um, the, the red zone, working in the red zone above the red line stops now. We've, let's, let's find something, a realistic target, daily capacity. And we defined that and we planned around it. So I said, anything, any refugee that comes on top of that number, I'll find a way to, do, to handle it. Yeah? Um, so we essentially created stable, uh, circumstances for the people that were there and then I brought in not me personally but we, we all together kind of <laughs> asked the German army for help we asked the German labor agency for help the health insurances for help the German pension fund for help so we actually were giving chunks of processes to other people we were also um, uh, centralizing paper files in one weekend um, a private company took 17,000 paper files and uh, put them into a central registry so that we could essentially, we were losing two to three hours a day in finding the right file because it was somewhere with somebody and nobody knew anymore where the files were. So we were able to centralize that and we were giving them to the customers, um, to the, to the caseworker with the customer and, in, and the translator um, instead of kind of the caseworker finding them. You know? So we were able through all these measures to, to triple the capacity in about four months. Um, and we also had now processes where we were looking at customers, very, uh, at refugees very early uh, and seeing if we could handle uh, the request in three or five minutes without actually loading um, or bothering a caseworker with that. So this was now a fast moving line. Um, we had new facilities, so suddenly we could actually work um, or receive refugees day in, day out. We had waiting zones, the ICC, the Berlin ICC, I don't know if you know it, the Congress Center turned into our waiting zone. And now suddenly it started to look more like an airport than like a refugee camp in Jordania where we were receiving the, the refugees. So a lot of things changed. Um, and so now the question is, what took so long? Yeah? So what were the causes? And I think the very first level I already explained, we were simply lacking manpower. But that is not the entire explanation. Um, we were also missing strategies. Yeah? So there was no plan anywhere how, to, how the organization should adapt if the number of refugees doubled and then doubled again and then doubled again. Yeah? So who took the time to think through the organization and ask the big question like, what's the refugee number we should prepare for? And how should we actually, what is our plan B and plan C when our internal people are not enough? Yeah? This question was never asked, the strategies were never created. Yeah? And for me, this is, this is a big question. How can it be that an organization is not creating strategies thinking through the future? Yeah? And this for me is a big, say again? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's also the public sector, I think, that um, I have learned to my many years that um, a lot of public sector agencies um, expect the political level or the ministerial level to come up with strategies. Yeah? So we wait for the laws to be written and that's our strategy. And for me the big learning is no, that's not enough. Yeah? There are big questions that no law will ever answer. Like for example, what's the number of customers we should prepare for? Um, what are the facilities we should be in? Which of our processes will break first? Um, what type of IT support do we need for the processes of the future, etc. So everything I would call an operational strategy um, will never be covered by law. And so we need agencies, government agencies, to think this through by themselves yeah? <coughs> without waiting for an official top-down request. And for that they need 
A, capacity, and B, competencies. So anybody here is a lawyer or has a law degree before I keep going? <laughs> so how does a lawyer learn, or how does a government um, executive that comes with a law degree, how do they work typically? Yeah? Um, they essentially have a pile of books, that's at law. They actually receive a paper file that is the, um, the case at hand, and they study, and then they write essentially um, a document, more or less a verdict, and then they pass it on to somebody to, to comment and review. It's a very paper-based, one-on-one, sequential process. Yeah? And what does a consultant or a private sector manager do? Calls a meeting, has everybody around the table, Yes, some bosses, but also some people from the, from the ground, from the field, uh, throws the, project on the, uh, the problem on the table and says, how do we solve this? What would you do? What you would you do? What are the reasons? Um, why are we not getting, why are we in this mess? Yeah? And government just doesn't work that way. Yeah? And I think this has to do with um, people with law degrees not used to it. They don't learn it during their university times. It's also discouraged because it makes you look vulnerable. Um, you're asking questions rather than giving answers. You might even say something like, I don't have a clue, what would you do? Which is very, very, very uncomfortable. Um, and so it's not done. Yeah? And that means that in t terms of crisis, um, or whenever there's a new problem that has not been dealt with before, it takes a long, long time for this traditional way of working to come up with a solution. Yeah? And the people on the ground are very often not heard. Yeah? They don't have a stake. And so we need to essentially, we need to have government leaders that feel comfortable with this type of working. And that's why I think it's so important to have management experience. It doesn't have to be a management degree, but it should be people who are exposed to this type of working and who are then coming into the government agencies with a fresh approach. Yeah? And I don't mind if those are experienced externals that are coming in into leadership positions like I was lucky to, to be able to do, or if it's externals. Yes, I am also applying or suggesting that we need more consultants in, in the government for this type of working. It's very unpopular, especially in Berlin. Yeah? If you um, read the newspapers and you see a politician who says, I don't really know how to do this, so I ask a consultant to help me. That's essentially the same as saying, I'm completely incapable, I'm a complete idiot, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know why I haven't resigned yet, but I'm sure you'll ask for it very soon. So it's impossible. It's culturally impossible to ask for help in the government, at least in Berlin, but it's also um, outside of Berlin. And this is also where you as a citizen and as a media consumer, where the media folks, etc., cetera, um, have a responsibility. Yeah? We need to appreciate, we need to reward politicians to say, the world is complex, I know some things, I especially know what I want to accomplish, what I think needs to be done, but I'm not the expert on how to do it. Yeah? I'm not a transformation expert, I'm not somebody who knows how an organization like a big government agency should play. Yeah? I don't know how an IT strategy for an agency should look like, so yes, I am asking for help. Yeah? The soccer teams in Berlin have coaches, the orchestra in Berlin has a conductor, yeah? yes, Good people, good teams can, have, can, can become even better if they allow a professional from the outside to, to lead them. Yeah? So I think this is a cultural thing. And um, for me, the root cause that there was not enough management competence and also not capacity for managing in the organization. Yeah? And um, I think, yeah, so I think that um, another learning for me, um, the Lageso was a very close shop. Um, we were not especially in the crisis, we were not able to listen to anybody anymore. Yeah? There was opposition in the parliament, there was the um, municipal level, the local level, the Bezirke, yelling, we have refugees homeless here, we had the volunteers who were saying the Lageso is treating the refugees like crap, um, and they are not even listening. We had doctors help, uh, offering help, we had other government agencies offering help, and the Lageso was sitting there um, deaf. Yeah? Um, what had happened? Again, the management side of things, the Lageso was so overtaxed that it didn't even have time to think what it needed. Yeah? Um, so it couldn't answer if the help that was offered was actually welcome, was helpful, was effective, or it was not. And if it was not helpful, then at least be nice and say thank you, but right now we need this and this and not that and that. The Lageso was incapable of doing that. And, um, I actually realized that um, we were in such a bad position 
when we just looked at the media, what was said and written about the Lageso, um, since the Lageso was completely overtaxed, we were not present in the media. Nobody was paying attention or giving us the benefit of the doubt or we were not credible anymore to make our own case yeah, that we were trying hard. Instead, all these externals that were trying to do something with us were actually in the press complaining that we were deaf and not doing a, uh, anything of a good job. And so I started to talk to all these people and explain to them the transformation that we are in. And um, I, we didn't, nobody of us went on TV, but uh, this changed a lot the dynamics. Because these people that were five minutes ago saying the Lagizo is not getting anything done, were suddenly starting to say things like, yeah, we are seeing some things that are already improving. I know they're working very, very hard on transforming this and this. And so the mood was a little bit shifting. And that was also very important for the employees on the inside, that some of the extra work they were now doing was credited, yeah, was appreciated. Um, and I also actually tried to find inlets where external ideas could come in. So I, I called a roundtable of uh, Berlin's digital founders. A lot of them were super um, engaged in, in volunteer work because this was a citywide crisis where a lot of citizens, I mean, you were probably also engaged. Um, and so we, I called a roundtable from my McKinsey time. I still knew a lot of founders, etc., and asked them, what should we do? Yeah, and they all wanted to rip out our government computer systems and replace them with more apps. And I told them, I love that. That takes about three years at the best. Um, and three, uh, two years of that is the uh, data security um, checkup process that we would have to go through. Mr. Schalbo was laughing because he knows what I'm talking about. Um, I was blank blatantly wrong, by the way, on this. I don't know if you know this, but um, during the very same time, a revolution happened in the background. From February 2016 onwards, um, every refugee was fingerprinted, and we had a national database of fingerprints, um, and 100% of the refugees coming into Berlin were actually now um, checked if they were double registered. And this was a revolution, because this happened within about six months that the system was created from scratch, and this is almost impossible. Uh, this would have taken 10 years probably one year earlier. Yeah? So this is the benefit or the, the beauty of the crisis. But anyway, all these digital folks in Berlin wanted to rip out government systems. And in the end, what we came up with is, uh, let's reach out to refugees where they are, which was Facebook, in languages they understand, which was Arabic. Um, we created FAQs uh, together with these digital folks. So how should a refugee manage us? Yeah? What should they bring? What should they not do? Um, one of the golden rules was whenever a government person is asking you for money, he or she is not a government executive. Mm -hmm. So we, you are living in a different country. We are here to give you money. You are not supposed to pay anything. Yeah? Um, and so this was one of the rules. Yeah? And this was spoiling our reputation. I mean, refugees were essentially talking in Arabic how crappy the processes were because people were skimming them. Yeah? So. We actually had our FAQs and we teamed up with a Facebook group with 100,000 Syrian refugees in Germany and we were posting these FAQs to that group and so the refugees were actually better informed. Yeah, yeah so for me the learning is we need to open the barriers between government, private sector, this innovative power from the digital sector needs to come into the government and um, we need to change some rules for that, government procurement, is excluding any company that's less than two or five million in size, euros in size, because they're not reliable suppliers, um, the, which means no startup will ever be allowed to, to provide services to the government. So there needs to be something there. Yeah? And I think, for me, the learning is when we do let innovative ideas happen, for example, a startup supplying ideas and solutions to the government, so yes, some of them will go bankrupt. Yeah? Some of these new ideas will fail we will lose some money. And then again, what will happen? The press will say, who was the politician who dared to actually invest 50,000 in an unproven technology from a small startup company? He wasted tax money. He should step down tomorrow. So unless we change a little bit how we think about failure in the government context, we can't expect government to be more courageous and try some experiments. And for example, let startups help them. Yeah? So there's something, again, where I think we all here in the room have a responsibility. If we want more flexibility, if we want more investment, 
we need to give government a little bit of leeway to fail. Yeah? Just like in the private sector. Look at a pharmaceutical company, how many billions they waste because they actually try to develop pharmaceutical products that never make, make it to the market. Yeah? And that's the logic of the industry. People are penalized if they are not trying those experiments. And in the government, we are 100% the opposite. Yeah? So that's where I think where we have to actually learn. And um, yeah, I think with that, um, we need more failures. We need more relaxedness um, from the population, from us, from the people. Um, we need also more interest. Yeah? You should all demand from your media magazines, from the newspapers, not only write about laws, um, but also about the way how these laws are actually put into practice. Yeah? The, the public sector, underneath the surface of the political stuff in the parliament, the public sector is super exciting, um, and we should read about it in the media. Yeah? Maybe we need new journalists from that, for that. Maybe we need people from Harvard Business Review, the management, the Fortune magazines, the, the Business Weeks, the manager magazine. Maybe they should write about the government processes as well. Yeah? We need to read about how government actually works. Yeah, and the final one, as I said, if we want more management competency in the public sector, we probably have to invest a little bit more. Yeah? And so that's for me where this... Um, we want more expertise, and that's where we actually have to be attractive as an employer for young people. And that's this last looming crisis that I was alluding to in the beginning. We are losing about 800,000 people to retirement in the next five to seven years. In Berlin alone, it's even more dramatic, 20 to 30,000 in the next three to four years. And that's 20% of the workforce in the next three to four years in Berlin. And where should all these young people come from? that are supposed to take these low-paying, borrowing government jobs where they are pushing paper files around day in, day out. And they're supposed to do this for 40 years. This is just not the world anymore where this is possible. Yeah? So we need to actually change a lot. Um, we need to say, no, we don't want to hire paper pushers. We do invest in those electronic filing processes, etc. We are shifting government resources away from borrowing back office to exciting front office stuff. We want more teachers. We want more pre-K um, pre um, educators in the, in the kitas. We want more social workers. We want more integration um, folks in the labor agencies, etc. And we want less people in the back office who are just entering data. Yeah? So we cannot replace these 800,000 one-to-one with the folks that are doing the job now. Yeah? So we need different skills and we should pay these people more, and we should invest and automate the back office so that we can increase, strengthen the front office so that more resources are invested for citizen service. Thank you. Mm. Please uh, feel free to have a seat. Is my microphone on? Excellent. All right, so my name is unpronounceable. You can just call me Raji or Bob, whatever you like. No. <laughs> All right, well, thanks very much. I scribbled down notes as um, you went along, and I, you're not supposed to look at them. And I have a, a thousand different questions, but maybe I can just uh, pick off where, where you left off and have more of a conversation than, than just a Q&A, um, which is that you left off with the you know, idea that we live in a society here in Germany where where a failure is not tolerated, and that this is an important step towards, um, I guess, more, I'm just gonna use the word innovation, but more innovation in all aspects of governance, because that's what's going to, to move us forward. Now, it's interesting because I've, I've lived in Germany for 15 years now, and it's a, very, it's a very curious place to live as a foreigner, because it's a place where it's incredibly easy and efficient to live, if you know the rules and you can play by the rules and you fit the model over here, if those three criteria are satisfied, there's no easier place in the world to live. Where crap hits the fan is when that doesn't happen, which is what we saw, I guess, in the context of the refugee crisis. And I've asked myself over the years why this is. And one thing that I think, I believe, is that social problems, and this is related to your idea of the lack of tolerance for failure, social problems, in my experience in, in Germany, are treated as if they're engineering problems. 
So, you know, there's a problem out there. There is a fix, and we know what that fix is. It's just a question of correct implementation. Okay, and, and this is, it's interesting. I think it's worked very well for a long time because this has been a country where since World War II, things have gone remarkably well and crisis free, all things considered. So that, you know, model of the world, social problems as engineering problems is a great model as long as you don't have a crisis. And then something like this comes along and you sort of point it to, sorry, this is starting to be a monologue. I will get to a question eventually. <laughs> but um, you sort of, pointed to, you know, why we have this sort of, I'm going to call it engineering, you called it more rule-bound um, type society, and you pointed to one reason, which is that, you know, there are all these lawyers out there that are determining how the bureaucracy functions, but I, now I'm going to get to my question, I'd go one step backwards in some ways and say, well, you guys have decided to put those lawyers in those functions, so it's one thing to say we should tolerate more failure, we should have more consultants and more creativity and all the rest of this in, but is there something fundamental about the German psyche? And here I'm going beyond my competence as an economist, but is there something fundamental about the German psyche that just makes you averse to this idea of allowing for failure? Because, I don't know, you have shell shock after the war, or I don't know. All of the above, yeah. And um, I mean, imagine now if we had this engineering-driven um, central state in a, in a French model or something, where um, Germany has 11,000 municipalities, 400 counties, 16 states, hundreds of state agencies, etc., and everybody is more or less autonomous because the the Allies after World War II gave us a very decentralized constitution, um, and so now everybody is engineering in their local little space. Yeah? Now imagine we had this as a central model, so this was ho would be horrible. So in a way we are super complex, super redundant, but at the same time, at least in a crisis, we have these local cells of um, some isolated creativity. Yeah? You had many communities in Germany that were doing quite well in the, uh, in the refugee crisis. Yeah? Um, I think that indeed, the model of uh, how government actually used to be, and also how politics used to operate, I think that model is coming indeed to a certain end. Yeah? If you look at the coalition contract now, we essentially have an attempt again where um, our government is looking four years into the future and tries to predict 100% of the projects they want to do three and a half years Absolutely. from now. Absolutely, engineering. Um, that's very engineering yeah. driven. Um, and at the same time, you probably have a Chancellor, Angela Merkel, who smiles secretly and says, in two years' time, we have Fukushima 3, um, whatever, Libya exploding, a crisis coming along that makes the second half of the, um, of the term um, dedicated again to crisis management. Yeah? So you have a so world... This is the old adage, never let a, crisis, a good crisis go to waste. Yes, so she actually lives on that. And she even tells you now, I mean, you can see it on TV, that she says that the old way of doing politics top-down with long-term plans, etc., is a little bit over. Um, why are you always asking for reforms? We don't have time for reforms. We have too many crises to manage. Yeah? And um, I don't like that because um, <coughs> at the same time, I think we need to prepare the machinery in the background. Yeah? We need to be more resilient, more crisis resilient. Um, we need to increase our flexibility. We need to actually make sure that the government machinery um, is more adapt for cri coming crises, etc. Yeah? So not only the political level, but also the machinery underneath. And so, um, in a way, that means um, that I think we need to shift or change some fundamental levers. For example, fewer people with law degrees heading those agencies. I want um, more, yeah, as I said, more innovation um, kind of baked into the system. There is far less, uh, far more flexibility on a legal level um, than government lets on. So if you look at the laws, the laws allow a lot more than is actually let on. So we need to give people almost like a carte blanche, yeah? go crazy. These are the limitations, but they are far less limiting than you think. Yeah? And so I still believe that um, a lot of um, freedom and motivation can be released in the, in the administrative level. I saw that in the Lageso, I was blown away how motivated the people were. When I asked them for their ideas, they had gazillions. 
when I asked them, do you want to do some extra work, I asked my, my, the middle management there, do you want to actually prepare, you have an in-house consultant, yeah? I happen to be your president now, but I'm also a consultant, um, you never had a consultant, do you want to actually do a strategy project, yeah? do you want to think about the future, what is happening, Berlin is a growing city, things are changing around you, how do you want to adapt, how do you want to change, do you want to do some extra work and create some strategy papers for this, and they all, all volunteered and said, yes, 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 we want to do that. Yeah. So there's a lot of motivation, I think, in the administrative level, and we need to release that. Yeah. Okay, but that's going to involve giving individual bureaucrats, and well, two things, right? One is changing the structure of incentives and freedoms, and the other is giving individual bureaucrats more leeway in terms of making Training, decisions. Rotation programs that they can actually go for two years to the private sector and learn something, have them work in a startup, then come back. Maybe they will never come back. But, um, that's I, know, I know you're yeah. coming to this mm -hmm. from you know, your consulting background, and um, I find it fascinating on multiple levels um, in that you know, I, we teach, we're sitting here in a business school, I teach at a business school, so I'm very sympathetic to you know, the merits of business, but I do feel that in Germany especially, and this is not unique to Germany, this is true of many countries, there is an inherent suspicion of the private sector, I'm gonna call it meddling, too much in public sector activities. Now, there are some good reasons for that, and we don't need to, we just need to look across the Atlantic to see why there may be some good reasons for that. Um, but you strike me as being excessively optimistic regarding the scope for that in Germany, given the seeming you know, inherent tension between the public and the private sector, or maybe I'm too cynical. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be cynical. I could be cynical, of course. Yeah. Um, well, then tell me why you see the scope for that, given the suspicion. I think that um, the private sector, you're absolutely right, I think that the private sector is looked at with suspicion. By the way, this is, th this is happening on the other side as well. Yeah? Um, in Berlin, we have gazillions of companies that are looking for employees, um, and at the same time, we have handicapped people that are looking for jobs, and the government pays a lot of money to, to give them everything they, they need to, to have a successful start. Yeah? And still, private startups, et cetera, in Berlin are not hiring these folks because they are scared to death of the bureaucracy that comes with hiring a handicapped person. There's a legal requirement that every company is supposed to hire X percent of handicapped people, and even the most well-meaning startup is shying away from it because they are scared of the bureaucracy, which means, um, I think, th that is irrational. Yeah? I mean, if you really need somebody and you're hiring programmers in Romania, and there are handicapped programmers in Berlin not finding jobs, I mean, that, this is odd. Yeah? So we need to be a little bit more flexible on that side as well, but I think, yes, the bigger ch um, chunk of challenge is on the public side, distrusting the private sector. Um, in a way, this again has to do that they are scared of um, meddling with people becoming the, the appearance of corruption is, um, and the appearance of um, giving advantages to is, is really scaring them in a lot of ways. Yeah? Up, up to a point where it's completely irrational. If you do a government procurement process, you are completely allowed to ask every vendor you know, how would you do this? So you can do a market research phase, so that you are making sure you're not buying yesterday's products, but that you are actually in sync with the market developments. Hardly any government agency I know does that, because they are scared that if they ask 12 vendors, that vendor number 13 will yell at two years later, I was not asked. Bad luck. I mean, you can document this very well. This is, you need some support maybe in making sure you have a very good process. This is possible. Use it. Yeah? So I think um, there are many, many more ways where, where the um, public sector could actually be more let me say, innovative in the way how they conduct their business. One other example is that um, um, a lot of times regulators don't dare to understand the business of the people they regulate. Yeah? Because even understanding how, for example, businesses operate already appears to be kind of meddling. Yeah? Germany has no corruption problem. Um, I looked at the latest numbers. Um, the German FBI, the BKR, found um, 220 million in corruption damages in 2015. 220 million euros sounds like a lot of money. We have total government expenditures of 1,200 billion. Yeah, so it's 0.01%. Um, 
And we are actually really tossing out the baby with the bathwater. We are so scared of corruption, and the, the, the public is so um, willing to assume corruption everywhere that we are yeah, leaving out millions of opportunities to be more innovative, to actually understand better your customer, to actually bring in innovative supplies, etc., because of this stupid corruption problem. Yeah? So a journalist asked me recently, so when you do all this private sector meddling, etc., will the corruption go up? And I said, yes. It will go up from 0 0.01 to maybe 0 0.02. For the benefits that are more than transferred For the benefits, to. yes. Yeah. Um, I feel like I should open up the floor for questions, but I have one last one, which has to do with, uh, you know, you sort of mentioned the many benefits, and I agree with you, of private sector involvement, but one of the things that you closed with is this whole digital thing, and I know that that is the big buzzword in Germany now, you know, before it was the Energiewende, now it's the digital bloody, I still don't know what digital means, but anyway. Um, you mentioned this uh, near the end of your talk, and I was wondering there whether there aren't, especially in view of the news right now with the Facebook scandal, whether there aren't serious concerns there in the context of um, privacy and data protection. So digital is good, yes, because if nothing else, it allows for information dissemination and aggregation and reaching your right market, but it's a double-edged sword. How do you want to balance that, especially in a country like Germany where privacy protections, this is something that in retrospect I'm grateful for, um, are really important? Absolutely, yeah. Um, for me, this is also a super important um, obstacle. The way how we actually talk about privacy in the government context, from my perspective, is um, yes, very ineffective. Yeah? Uh, and I think we should change it. For me, very simply spoken, um, I would split the whole discussion into two parts, and I would treat these two parts completely separate. So there's stuff that happens without the citizen knowing. Yeah? So it's either secret services, whatever, um, government agencies behind the back, security agencies, or private sector people um, pulling data together, happening essentially behind the citizen's back. And we should have very, very strict and good and transparent privacy laws there. And this should be the focus of our privacy regulators, yeah, the Datenschutzbeauftragte. And then there's a second thing, and that is where the citizen asks the government for a service. Um, for example, I want some benefits. Yeah? Right now, we're treating those two cases, something happens behind the citizen's back versus the citizen asks for some support, some service, we treat them completely the same way. And I would dare to say that about 95% of the government resources in privacy protection is invested in this service part, making sure that agency one doesn't know what agency two knows already, asking the citizen again and again and again to provide your address and how many kids do you have, again and again and again, because this is privacy protected, and only 5% of the resources are helping the citizen against things that happen behind his back. Yeah? And I think we need to treat these two things completely separate. I, I would shift point. all the government resources into the first part, and let's give free data flow where the government actually provides services. Yeah? If I want to rent an apartment in Germany from a private person, and the private person will ask me, can I have a Schufa Auskunft on you? Yeah? So kind of a, a credit, credit rating, rating, your credit rating. And if I, don't, if I refuse to do that, um, I will not get the apartment. If I go to any type of government uh, agency, like job center, etc., they don't ask me for the Schufa Auskunft. Instead, there are government agencies who actually have to investigate if there are any bank accounts in your name. You're declaring, I don't have any money, I want now government welfare, and they are not asking for a Schufa Auskunft, yeah, because they're not allowed to for privacy reasons. For me, this is mind-blowing. We could it's save so much money on um, and invest it in better education for children if we are not r wasting so much time investigating in double entry and triple entry and quadruple entry. Yeah. I think that that distinction is very, very useful. Uh, information that a citizen voluntarily gives for their private benefit versus data protection that protects a citizen against unaware, you know, yes. Uh, dissemination of information that they aren't aware of. And let me just make a plug here, especially as a researcher, this is in incredibly frustrating. And in the context of refugees, you hear these perverse stories where you know there's a refugee that needs a job. There are companies in Berlin that would love to offer refugees these jobs. And then going back to your, your old role in, in Legezo, you talk to you know the head of the Legezo Heime, and they are not allowed to ask people yes. living in their homes what their skills are. 
so that they could, in principle, match these people that are looking for jobs Absolutely. with potential employees. Yes. So, and this is all under the guise of data protection. So yes. I agree, it's completely yes. perverse, and that distinction is very yes. useful. So that's the Zweckbindung, which means essentially a government agency can only ask for information that it needs to do its job. And since not to provide service, not to provide the service, and since the shelter, it doesn't matter providing a bed to a PhD versus to a to a mason, um, it's the same bed. So they don't ask for this type of information. Huh? We are asking, we are not asking people um, that are coming here. Um, do you have family in Jordania or in Syria or in, in any of the refugee camps in Turkey or wherever? We're not asking them. How, because it's irrelevant from a government perspective in Germany. However, it makes all the difference for the way how these folks actually approach their job search. Yeah? If they have two kids and a wife, um, they will take any job. Yeah? They screw their own career opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the German government is trying to explain to them how important an apprenticeship is, an Ausbildung, where you only make 400 euros, but after three years you get this quite gigantic job opportunity as a Facharbeiter, etc. They need the money now. They need the money now. They have two small kids in Jordania in a, in a refugee camp. Yeah? They take any job in a warehouse. Yeah? And we don't know because we don't ask. It is perverse. Yeah, so. I could keep talking, but I should probably open the floor up for questions. Are there questions from the audience? There's a microphone going around. Thank you for this very uh, inspiring insight. My name is Ben Salmel. I'm working for Lead Academy, a think tank here in Berlin. And uh, I think it's really interesting how you explain very vividly the challenges that Lagiza was facing, especially uh, in adapting to the challenges in, a, in, in the earlier stages. And yet, at the same time, if you look at uh, what happened in the, in the, like the, with the volunteer initiatives and in the, in the, in the heat places like the big um, refugee camps, um, there, there were some, um, some solutions found very, very quickly, like within days. Um, I mean, and, and the thing is that the nine million volunteers that worked in that field took very entrepreneurial approaches and were oftentimes very successful. And I conducted some interviews in that area and it turns out that the, fa the fact that they didn't have structure and that they didn't have any hierarchies and like platforms and processes and so on was part of the um, like key for that to, to happen and for them to be so resilient. So my uh, question is, how do you per what do you perceive were the main barriers within the public sphere that limited this kind of entrepreneurial mindset and what, what were the success strategies that you used in order to make that possible again? Yeah, um, I think the very first part was that um, Andockpunkt is the word I'm looking for in German. So, I mean, you need to essentially bring the, the spheres together. There needs to be almost, a, let me call it an organizational interface. Yeah? If you have that, then there is a chance that these two <coughs> spheres can actually innovate together. Um, and we didn't have that. And in general, government doesn't have that. Yeah? Um, if you think, for example, um, now there's a hackathon coming along, um, actually around dig government digitalization. That's not an organizational interface. At the end, there needs to be budgets, there needs to be framework contracts, there needs to be um, essentially a way to engage any of the solutions at scale. Uh, government, due, um, due to uh, protect against corruption, always has to do tender offers. So a very innovative startup that doesn't have a competition because it's number one, um, needs to be evaluated. How do you evaluate something that has that doesn't have a competition yet? Yeah? So those things are very, very complicated. And um, very concrete in the Lageso sense, integration was never in the job description of the Lageso. It only became a job description. Yeah? For example, one thing we did, um, we opened 120 refugee shelters all over Berlin in a couple of months. In around six month time frame, we opened 120 shelters. Um, it was an incredible expansion. And um, we thought about how do we actually um, jumpstart integration and how do we open up these shelters to the volunteers around them. And so we paid for a full-time person, depending on the size of the shelter, but I think anything that has 500 refugees and above had a full-time person that was only there to coordinate with local volunteers. Um, so that was the organizational interface. All the volunteers could come to this person and the, refugee, the, the volunteers could complain to us if they were not given access. Yeah? There were, we had some very bad shelter operators. This was also a time where about 3% of the shelter operator world 
was um, showing the worst of the human side. Yeah? So some of them actually were not interested to having volunteers sniffing around, realizing that hmm, when there are eight social workers to be around, I'm only seeing this one. Where are the others? Yeah? Um, so they, they tried to keep their shelters secluded, and the refugees didn't know. So we actually used this also to kind of increase quality and gave the refugee, um, the, the volunteers, a chance to kind of get in. Um, and this was for us now suddenly a, an early warning system, yeah? a quality management system. So very, very helpful. But we needed to create this organizational interface first. Yeah? Any more questions? Yes, thanks very much again for your insights. Um, you also talked not only about Nagisa, but also about the general question of how do we improve our public service, right? And I very much like your, um, well, your request of being more open to failure, right? Um, I did miss one point, however, and I would like to ask you that point. Um, how about the structure of our public service? Now, um, we have this Beamten system, whatever that is in English. Civil, uh, civil servant. Well, it's more than that. It's really, we have the Angestellten civil servant, then we have yeah. the Beamten, the people you can never get rid of whatever happens, even if the world breaks apart or so. Um, I mean, seriously, this system, even for the most motivated people, does not really give benefit if you do a good job, and it does not really punish you if you do a bad job. Within that system, and that's the core, of course, of our public uh, system, how do we want to improve the system if there's no benefit and no punishment? Yeah, the interesting thing is, why are people joining the public service? Um, they are not looking for financial rewards. Yeah? Because if you're looking for financial rewards, you will not go there. Yeah? They're looking for a cause. A lot of them really go because they want to have positive impact on society. A lot of them go because they look for job stability. So the very problem that you are laid out is essentially almost like a, a fundamental attraction to a certain population that we might otherwise not get. Yeah? And um, I think that means that I have a very, very balanced view. And I came around, I mean, I started as a McKinsey consultant. And as a McKinsey consultant, you want to fire everybody who doesn't do a good job tomorrow. Um, and you believe in outsized bonuses so that people actually do crazy things, work 24 hours per day, and so on. We do have a certain thing of financial incentivization in the public sec sector. And I think that the time it takes to administer that system far outweighs the motivational aspect. I think it's far more demotivating to the people who do not receive these little incentives than it's motivating to the people who do. So I would get rid of all that and I would essentially say, let's make sure that the people who are there um, are working in customer service. They are really, so that, that they are, uh, the purpose of their work is actually coming through so that they are not losing so much time and are getting frustrated through strict hierarchies, through um, super slow promotions, through very back, uh, inefficient back office um, processes. For example, um, people in the serv uh, civil servants pay for their own Christmas parties. Yeah? Taxpayers are not paying the Christmas parties. Yeah? Taxpayers are not paying the coffee. I mean, if we try to go with this type of mindset into the private sector, we wouldn't get any people anymore. Yeah? Because people want to, to be part of a um, they want to get more than um, just a salary from an employer. Yeah? They want to be a team, they want to be rewarded, they want to be appreciated, etc. So I think that the problem is not so much the actual fact that we can't fire people. If you look at the German DAX, yeah, the private sector um, stock index, um, you can't fire anybody from RWE, from E.ON, mm, pretty much not Commerzbank, Deutsche Telekom, Deutsche Post, Deutsche Bahn, um, so, I mean, if I go through the, the private sector list, yeah, there are gazillions of companies you can't fire anybody from anyway. Um, so, from that perspective, it's the German model that we don't do hire and fire, and I appreciate that model. Let's make sure that in the private sector, people can work for the purpose that they came, signed up for. Um, and let's do one thing, though, and that is, you heard of the Peter principle. Everybody is promoted up to the point where they are in over their head, and then there's no way down. Um, hardly anyone, for example, the, the job that I had exists exactly 32 times in the state of Berlin. 
So I had salary level B4, and there are exactly 32 B4 positions in the state of Berlin. And um, if we want to actually promote somebody, the law has to be changed. Yeah? And a, a 33rd B4 position has to be created in the state of Berlin. So this makes no sense. We want to be able to promote people for a couple of months or years into a project role, um, and maybe if they don't work out, we want to actually um, tell, tell them, okay, it didn't work out, you have to go back to the previous position. They don't lose their job, but they will lose the last promotion. So my, my model would be that I would say, especially for government agency heads, I would tell them, um, congratulations, we want to promote you. You have two envelopes here. This comes from the matrix, blue pill, red pill. I don't know if you know it. Um, there are two envelopes here, you, two, government, two work contracts, and um, you pick which, ones you sign, which one you sign. One has your regular promotion, can't be taken away until you turn 65, so it's another 15 years to go. Um, if you fail, yeah, we will all have to live with the consequences. We, we will probably push you aside. We change the law, we create a new position so that we find another person to lead the agency. It sucks for everybody, but you have your promotion safe. Here's the other model. It's a five-year term limit contract, like a Geschäftsführervertrag in a Privatwirtschaft. And um, your promotion will actually go back to the previous one if it's not extended, but you get double the salary. And you choose. So I think for five years, double the salary, I think a lot of people would take it. And if we realize that the agency head is in over his or her head, then at least they could go back and they still have a safe job. Yeah? That would be my, my model of transition. Yeah? I think that we're almost out of time, unless there's a burning question anywhere. Okay, two burning questions. Let's just take them both then, and then maybe we can answer them and, and wrap this up. Hi, my name is Ulf, I'm a service designer and I was wondering in the UK there's a government agency called Government Digital Service GDS, and it's in yeah. charge for the transformation processes and is there any exchange or have you had any exchange with those people? Yeah, well, maybe we can just take the second question Ooh, as well. That means I have to write down, okay. GTS. I'm good, no problem. Hello, uh, my name is Joyce, a 2018 MBA student. Um, I have a question because I'm quite, uh, kind of curious about a, a refugee, uh, about what you are doing. So uh, in the world, actually, there are a lot of uh, non-profit organizations. So did Lagisha cooperate with this organization in order to enlarge your capability to, uh, to handle those issues? If not, do you have any plan to do? Yeah, this is my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start with the first one. So yes, during my McKinsey time, I was actually very fortunate to work internationally, but my clients don't. Yeah? So um, I think that the public sector in Germany especially is very, very insular. Yeah? Um, lawyers can't go internationally for university because the, lo the, the law base is so national that very few of them go through student exchanges, so very few of them actually have very good English skills. That limits significantly the, the um, confidence level of government executives in Germany to go abroad and look for good ideas, yeah? which is very sad, which is a big problem. Yeah? Um, the, the likelihood that somebody says it's Austria, so it's not Germany, so it's not relevant, it's England, etc., cetera, um, that likelihood, unfortunately, is very, very high. Um, there's also a cultural difference, and England is a very good example in some other countries as well. Germany's um, central institutions, so the, the Chancellery of Angela Merkel, for example, um, is not an implementation force. So, Richtlinienkompetenz means, um, so that's her right to kind of set the, the guidelines of politics. That essentially is one, almost 100% geared towards um, what type of law are we going to get and not how do we manage big transformational projects. Yeah? So if you look at the, the chancellery in Germany, um, there are hardly any people who are doing project supervision. 
It might change now. There was some news in the last couple of days, but traditionally, um, the chancellery is not in charge of any projects. Um, and so that means that the projects are all cut on the, on the borders of the ministries and federal projects from Berlin never really reach municipal or uh, um, state level. Um, and that's very, very different in England. Yeah? GDS is actually directly um, attached to the prime minister's office and um, they essentially take personal responsibility for large transformational projects. They make sure that HMS, so the finance ministry and the DWP, et cetera, that they, all these, that's the um, labor agency and the retirement fund, et cetera, that they all work together for large digital changes, um, that they all have the same PC and stuff, and stuff like that. And it takes us 10 years longer to get there because we are not, uh, our central politicians, our most powerful politicians are shying away from implementation work implementation responsibilities. Yeah? That's a core cultural difference and a big problem in Germany. Yeah? Um, again, might change now, but um, unfortunately, the downside for the politician trying this is very high because suddenly the project is his or her failure. Um, so there's a big, big hurdle. Yeah? Second question, the NGO part. I talked a little bit about the, the volunteer organizations already. Um, that we were working together with. Um, let me do, answer this question forward-looking. Integration is still a huge challenge in Germany because there's no single institution in charge of integration. Depending on who the refugee is, sometimes he or she wants to go to school, sometimes he or she wants to work, sometimes he or she is um, mother or father with small children, um, want to go to university, want to get an apprenticeship, etc. So very different constellations might be um, an approved asylum seeker, so an official refugee, might still be in Duldung, so in this, inter in this essentially has a um, um, no decision, um, or might still be in waiting. And depending on this constellation, very different organizations in Germany are in charge, and they all only solve one subset of the integration challenge. Yeah? I want to help you find the right school, I want to help you find the right university, I want to help you find the right apprenticeship, I want to help you find the right job, I don't care about your family situation, I do care about your family situation, so etc. Nobody has the whole picture. Yeah? And then if somebody is there, that person will speak German, but not Arabic, not Farsi, not Russian, etc. Yeah? So we need to make sure that we have a person of trust who can think through with the refugee the integration plan. And I think that is something that volunteer organizations are much better equipped to do than the government is. Yeah? Because they can think holistically, they can actually work in the mother language, they can actually um, really take, build a confidence, a, a trusted relationship with the refugee. So we need to encourage kind of a, a mixed model where the government is there to ask for contributions and activities, etc., and then have volunteer organizations who are paid for the government to some extent to build one-on-one -on -one trusted relationships with the refugees as mentors, coaches, etc. Yeah, that would be my model, and we are not there yet, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, unfortunately, we are actually out of time. Um, book that should have made its rounds. I uh, take a look at it if you're interested in it. It's available in a bookshop near you or failing that. And also, there's a website, gestaltenstadtverwalten.com, where you can send me questions and I gladly answer. It's a blog and you can also order the book through that website. Excellent. Um, with that plug, let me say thank you very much, Sebastian, for being Pleasure. here. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.